Good afternoon, all. I'm Louise from Harry, the people management tech platform, and currently we're helping businesses to manage their operating costs during this difficult period of time. Harry is delighted today to be partnering with Code Hospitality, who are also doing some amazing things and amazing initiatives to support the hospitality industry. I'm sitting today in the lovely Langston Hotel in Hailing Island, and I've got a great view of the, of the harbour in front of me. Very lucky to have this view. Um, so operators at the moment have, have shown nothing short of bravery and resilience, in my opinion, during this really challenging time. It's not necessarily going to get any easier in the run up to Christmas and over the next few months. And, um, and we have a great panel today who have shown that resilience. And they'll be talking about how they've been coping, how they've been leading their teams and, and how they've been planning for the future. And I think some real positive stories will come out of this, which is just what the industry needs at the moment. The session will be recorded um, and we'll send out uh, the, the recorded session following, uh, following the session today. Um, you can ask questions, so please do. You'll see the question tab at the top right hand corner of your screen. Um, and we'll answer those questions throughout the session today uh, and also at the end. I'd like to introduce the amazing Kieran Bailey uh, from Experience 101. And for those of you that, that don't know Experience 101, they, uh, they're an events business that, that put on some fantastic events before COVID hit. And again, a, a, real, a real bunch of troopers. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to you, Kieran. Welcome, thank you. Thank you. And uh, enjoy the session. I will have a great time. Thank you, Louise. So thank you very much for joining us, everybody. We've got an amazing panel today, as Louise said. My name is Kieran from EXP 101. Uh, we yeah. were doing events, but we've, as everybody, as 2020's word of the day is pivot. So we have done just that. But at EXP, we believe in sharing stories and solving problems. So to share some amazing stories, we're going to invite our panel to click themselves back into the screens anytime now. And they should all be listening to me. There we go. You see by them. Oh, it's magical. Magical. Technology. I love it when it works. It brings joy to my heart. Super stuff. So if you guys could just take a little round robin and introduce yourselves. Um, and as Jade is to my right on the screen, we'll start with you. Uh, a little bit about yourself, Jade, and your business. Yes. Hello, I am Jade. I'm the head of people at Faux Restaurants. So we are a nationwide Vietnam, uh, Vietnamese restaurant group. Uh, we've been operating for 15 years. I've only been in the business for just under two. Um, yeah, I mean, everything was very exciting. We had a big growth plan. We were really, yeah, looking to take over, you know, the world really before COVID hit. And we've had to obviously rail things back a bit and um, yeah, find new ways of doing new things. Amazing. Marco. Hi, I'm Marco. I'm the director of people and talent at Coot. Uh, Coot is an international uh, investment and operating company of hospitality businesses in the Middle East and the UK. Um, I uh, previously uh, I was previously HR director at uh, Leon and Black Sheep Coffee and at Bills, so I've seen a few restaurant brands. Um, I joined, interestingly enough, uh, Coot right in the middle of lockdown. Uh, so, so uh, but, which probably tells a thing or two about uh, the outlook that we have on uh, on the future, and um, you know, uh, there's a focus on our people. So, yeah, in the thick of it, uh, here we are. Amazing, Tobiana. I'm Tobiana, uh, founder of Kelly's Cause Foundation. So, Kelly's Cause is a charity that provides mental health first aid training in the hospitality industry. I'm um, also a chef, so have all the experience of actually being in the industry. Um, so, yeah. Amazing. So you've lived and breathed it. That's a wonderful yeah. thing. <laughs> and last but not least, Phil. 
Hey, I'm Phil. I'm the co-founder of Honest Burgers. We've got um, stalls all around the country nationwide, just similar size to Faux. Um, yeah, um, sell burgers, basically. <laughs> sell burgers. Simple. Life should be as simple as it could be, eh? So, Phil, let's, let's kick start with you. Maybe you could sort of describe the last seven months um, and let's try and do it in a few sentences if we can. Has it been seven months since this? It has. It's flown by, hasn't it? Shit. Um, the, um, uh, describe the like, yeah. I mean, it, it, obviously, it's not been a lot of fun at times. Um, we're all in uncharted territory. So, but we've just, you know, it's been quite um, a bit of a roller coaster, but in, in some ways, you know, we've had to be quite dynamic in the team, which has been, in a way, um, kind of fun behind the scenes in, in, in some regard. And I obviously. I don't want to paint Corona as being a fun experience, but um, no, it's been a bit of a roller coaster, hasn't it? I think it most certainly has, and yeah, I think it, what you're saying there is it's been a, it's been an interesting and useful experience, of kind of creating opportunities for you that you didn't necessarily expect. Yeah, it's, it's forced some stuff on us. It's forced some lenses on us internally, maybe as an industry, which um, yeah, some good and some bad lenses, I would say. And Jade, from Foe's perspective, you kind of touched on it in your intro. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, some some things that spring to mind are that it was frustrating and difficult, uh, but also that there were lots of silver linings and it was important to keep thinking about those and noticing those and talking about them. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, we had to sort of change our future plans, you know, for a while, which has been difficult, but we have, as you say, pivoted and we have managed to... Um, for now you know move through positively and do what we can but yeah i mean i think like phil said you just sort of things that maybe you'd thought about doing under different circumstances you know in the future you're actually just forced to do out of necessity um and whilst that whilst that's scary and difficult it's also a good push sometimes to have that for sure marco you joined yeah in, uh, in the heart of the thing yeah, I joined, um, I started going back into work when uh, London was empty, um, which was quite an experience. But uh, I think sort of to, I, I want to second what Jay just said is, the, as frustrating as it was and, and, and you know, having to be so reactive, um, it, uh, to, to strike the balance between reaction and then trying to maintain a positive outlook and seeing the opportunities as they arose i think we made the most of that uh, and also i think and uh, we made a lot of things happen much much quicker than uh, uh, than we normally would have done uh, because it's sort of you have this real sense of focus uh because you just have to get it done now there isn't there's just if, if there's so much riding on every decision that you take that uh, there's a real spotlight on on every project every decision uh a focus on what really matters in terms of priorities uh, is this going to go in the bin because it's it's not relevant now um and i think the, the important stuff is the floating to the top and opportunity includes people as well obviously so super anyway, stuff. rough ride yeah for everybody i guess Tobiana. Yeah, well, I mean, what we did was basically had to pivot to doing our courses online as much as we possibly could. Um, so we did that, and that was really great because uh, it kind of gave people a chance to, if you were, you know, furloughed or not working at all, or had lost their job, to kind of do something to focus on looking after their own mental health and then having those skills to kind of check in um, on the people around them. And you know, we were also putting out as many kind of resources and as much help as we could for people. Um, within the industry and kind of from both sides, um, you know, helping the, helping business owners in terms of uh, kind of resources in communicating with their staff and what they can do to look after their staff. And then also for the individual people working within the industry on things that they can do to look after themselves. Because obviously it was like, for I think for a lot of people, it was the first time that they may have really thought about their mental health and thought, but, you know, hang on a second, like I'm not feeling so great. It was a really tough time for everybody. So it kind of put everybody in the same boat. Um, which kind of brought mental health to the forefront, which was, you know, in some ways for us good. Um, so, yeah, just kind of pivoting more to that kind of online and, and individual help for people and, and resources that could help both businesses and everybody within the industry. Amazing. Uh, pivot is definitely the word of 2020, isn't it? I mean, I always, 
I just, I, I always think about Ross uh, from Friends on the staircase, <laughs> just screaming pivot. And then I, I made that reference to somebody and they kind of went, what is that? I was like, okay, now I feel old. Now I feel old. Um, so pivoting is definitely where we need to be aiming for. And Phil, from your perspective, what's, what's changed in your business um, where you think, actually, you know what, maybe I wanted to do that before lockdown, but the opportunity has been thrust out upon me to make those changes? Um, well, like almost in, in a way, everything, um, sort of from a structural point of view, I would say, or we're certainly on a journey to do it, like, like there's been loads of stuff that I've wanted to do for years within Honest and you know from when we started selling burgers in a tent in 2010 just me and Tom to now we haven't really well to seven months ago we haven't really ever it's been breakneck speed you know and we've been trying to retrofit and grow up with it and you know we you know the company kind of outgrew certainly I don't I won't speak for Tom but certainly grew, outgrew my ability and experience pretty quick so I've been kind of running to catch up and you know had those growing pains and making mistakes and trying to figure it out and all, all the while trying to do that while you're trading, which is difficult and still employing people and still sort of compounding some of those mistakes. So yeah, we actually, uh, one of the main things I've always wanted to be is, is, you know, the, the challenge for me is always that we want to grow the business, but we want to not, we want to be a chain, but not act like one. Um, and how we do that has always been a big topic of conversation. It's been quite difficult. And I've always thought it was just a case of me sort of, talking like this to our staff all the time, which I have done for the last eight years. And it actually took some really great people to come to our business and show me that through all the talk and all the bluster, actually, we're just organizationally. Is that a word? That is a word, isn't it? Yeah, let's roll with it. <laughs> the structure of our business, I was going to say again, organizationally, was set up like everybody else who's a chain. Um, so that's something that we're on a path. We, we're calling it the anti-chain kind of infrastructure, the anti-chain philosophy, which is um, we basically just ripping up the rule book and how the business is structured internally. So, you know, a hashtag that we use quite a lot is um, mentors, not managers. So we're kind of stripping away layers of management within the business and actually turning those guys into more mentor kind of support functions rather than just doing that classic boring thing of getting bigger and adding another layer of regional director and da, 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 which we have done by the way. And now we're just going to start unpicking. So that was quite a long answer to your quite simple question. Sorry. <laughs> what was the original question? It was how have I, what have I done differently? What, yeah, what challenges and what changes have we made? Um, Definitely well, answer. That's the big one, and I could talk a long time about that. And we're, we're only 30% through it, by the way. Yeah. Uh, we're just sort of starting. But, yeah, we, we've now had the confidence to just go and do that. And we, we believe it leads to better performance, of course. Like we, It's all about just driving autonomy down to the restaurants, which is where it should sit. And I mm. think anyone on this call would agree with me that mm. the, rest, the best restaurants we have or, or the, you know, within the group or we've ever worked in is when the team feel like they – take personal responsibility over the restaurant and yet we don't as larger businesses structure our businesses in a way to promote that we actually do the exact opposite mm -hmm. we get bigger and decide that we're going to take autonomy from people and not intentionally and that's the scary thing we do it just by adding layers of management and saying well this person is going to be, tell you what to do and give you kpis and reports and we just drag autonomy and responsibility away from people and actually are honest we've always believed in kind of local community kind of gm mentality and we're just going to actually have a structure that backs it up for a change. Amazing. Marco, when we spoke last week, you kind of, you, you indicated there was a, a fairly similar mindset on some things and the way that Coot operates. Does that sound, does it seem familiar? Yeah, it does. I mean, fundamentally, I think uh, Coot and, uh, and Honest Burgers are probably quite different from a setup point of view, but I think the philosophy is, is, is quite similar um, because number one in this is sort of, we, we, if you look at the opportunities there are, so we've done some restructuring as well, whereby uh, we've, we've put different types of managers into different types of places where they, uh, they uh, exactly as Phil just said, act much more like mentors and coaches um, rather than sort of the day-to-day the -day shift manager, really deluxe, um, what, what you get in a lot of businesses. Um, but I think we also, we, you know, we reacted to the to the new world in terms of delivery kitchens, for example, uh, whereby uh, you know we, it was clearly for, uh, obvious for everyone to see that uh, delivery just, like went through the roof. So we opened a number of delivery kitchens right in the middle of the pandemic, 
Um, so by doing that, we, sort of, we, we protected revenue, uh, which ultimately protected jobs. Um, and we redeployed people from one place where they weren't needed, uh, because weren't trading into other places, so, they, so we could keep them in a job. So there was a lot of stuff happening with lots of moving parts in a really short space of time. But it opened up opportunities for us uh, that, because obviously we're a multi-brand organization, it's opened up opportunities that we hadn't even thought of. So, you know, we wouldn't. So, we operate two Lebanese bakeries, for example, uh, at the moment in London. One in Tom Garden, and one in Harrods, which we've just opened in September. Um, but we also operated Lebanese bakery out of some of our delivery kitchens, and we never thought that it would be as successful as a delivery brand in certain parts of London. So now, all of a sudden, you think, Do you know what? We're still a business which wants to grow. So how about a bricks and mortar site in, in, a, in a location that we had not even thought of? So, so you know, allowing, uh, you know, being open-minded enough to, to go through this delivery business model allowed us to put virtual brands into places where we thought, you know, this is a brilliant testing field, which probably we wouldn't have had the guts to do before. So, um, but, but it was a necessity to protect revenue streams and, and mm -hmm. jobs that, you know, ultimately presented an opportunity to us where we said, you know what, why well, we didn't we think of this before? Um, it, it's, it's worked pretty really well, right? especially just to be open-minded and, and creative. So. Amazing. So, Rihanna, how, do, how would you go, would, have you got any tips for kind of those businesses who, so Marcus is very, uh, Marco is very lucky that he's able to be open-minded, they've got a business that said, yeah, opportunity has come along. Um, and we're going to roll with it and we're going to make it work. Not everybody's that comfortable with that. Have you got any tips about how people can kind of maybe uh, change that in their own minds a little bit? Uh, yeah, so I think something that Phil said that was really interesting was, um, you know, kind of getting rid of that hierarchy and having more mentors rather than managers is that actually all the research when you talk around mental health and work is that people feel more mentally healthy when the work that they're doing is, one, rewarding, uh, and two, when they feel like they have autonomy over things. So that word came up and that's such an important thing. If you can create a business structure where every person within your business feels like they have some level of autonomy over what they're doing, then everybody who's working for you is going to be happier. And to me, it's like, seems quite simple. That's like you have happier staff working, you have happier customers, your business is more successful, more people come back, you make more money. Um, but obviously not every business, you know, is able to do that. And, you know, hospitality is very hierarchical, especially in kitchens. Um, you know, it kind of relies on that structure. So I think that kind of this, this year is has been the perfect place for people to try out these new things. Um, as Phil was saying, they have, and what Marco was saying, they have as well. And I know lots of other businesses have done that, that, that pivot, as we keep talking about, towards kind of changing up that structure. But I think in all of it, the most important thing is the way um, that businesses are communicating these kind of changes with their staff. That's the most important thing is making sure that there's like real honesty, openness and transparency within the communication. And even if it does mean communicating, being like, we're going to try this thing. We're not going to we're not sure exactly how it's going to work. But like, you know, please kind of bear with us. Um, all of that kind of stuff is something that's so important because along with the fact that the more autonomy people feel like they have over their role, the more, you know, there's so much stuff for us to feel uncertain about at the moment. Whatever kind of certainty and kind of openness we can create, and you know, the more we know, the less likely we are to feel kind of anxious and, and worried about things. So that communication and being really open about those changes that might be happening is something that, that can be really helpful to ensure that, you know, the staff within a business don't, you know, know what's going on, basically. Perfect. And Jade, from from the perspective of firm, I mean, I, if I'm honest with you, I think that one of the fundamental changes I know is is I, I was very excited about you opening in Nottingham, and I've been watching that site. So on a selfish level, um, I, I'm, I'm slightly, I feel Airport's slightly short changed. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Patience is not my virtue. That's a <laughs> well, you know, yeah. I mean, like I said, you know, we, we did, we we've had to change the plans that we have. Um, for now anyway but touching on on what kelly said the whole communication side was something i actually found really difficult in the, during the last seven months partly because tech wise we just weren't set up for it and i wish that we had something that was a bit bit um that facilitated backwards and forwards of conversation a bit better than we had because i had mm -hmm. to do a lot of stuff by email which wasn't great 
we were looking, you know, we were sending out lots of letters and information that needed to be acknowledged, and that was quite difficult. So I have used um, different sort of platforms in the past, which I would have actually liked to have had this time, but you know, it was it was just how how it worked out at the time. But also in terms of being honest and having that open conversation with people, I have always been that way. In any, you know, I've worked in many restaurants in an HR role. I've worked in restaurants in pretty much, you know, any area of the restaurant you could imagine. So I know that it is so important to have the real story, but when you're actually sitting from this perspective and not wanting to scare people was one big thing. So being mm -hmm. honest, but measured because you actually still want them to feel okay was something I really had to consider a lot. Um, and I had a lot of coaching from my boss, Stephen, about that, you know, the, the founder of Fo, who who is really, he's just very intuitive and actually will say to you, yeah, this sounds like a, a fair thing to to say to people that won't alarm them but maybe this is a bit much you know and i needed that but yeah i mean uh toby Anna, you're just completely right you know giving people more autonomy we tried to do that a lot when we bring people back to work off furlough so mm -hmm. we had a lot of um safety you know around covid we've got loads of safety procedures in place but i set up an inbox just for people to actually contact me with suggestions about things that they thought we'd missed or maybe things that would work better in their site. And we actually had some really great suggestions that ended up being used across the business, which was fantastic. And people actually wanted to stick to the rules because they had to say in the rules. Um, so that was really good. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, um, it ties back into what Phil was talking about for the, 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 that mindset of kind of intent-based leadership, putting authority to information, you know, listening to the people who are right at the front of it, who actually are going to be living and breathing those actions on a daily basis. They have absolutely got the uh, some of the best answers and ideas for us. So how did we, thinking about kind of communication then, um, Marco, how did you, did you have to adapt the communication style within Qt to, uh, to overcome the kind of the, the challenges of maybe having some people furloughed and kind of, moving people around from spot location to location yeah i think uh, yeah look here and i i think we all agree that communication has never been more important than now and uh some of us are naturally gifted at being great communicators and others aren't um others are more reactive but i think uh, again it's sort of shown this real light on the importance of communicating with team members we didn't uh, initially have the, uh, uh, the facilities to, uh, to communicate with every team member in real time. Uh, you know, we had WhatsApp groups in, in, in restaurants and stuff, so nothing that, that's cohesive. And, and uh, it, it was just a bit tedious. Like Jade said, you know, in, with emails, you have this, this issue of tonality. And you know, it's, all, it's all a bit too formal. And you just want to have a chat with people. And Zoom has got its limitations as well. Uh, so we uh, were quite quick off the mark to introduce Yapster. Um, as a tool to, uh, to to being able, first and foremost, being able to reach out to every single person. Um, uh, and it's completely transformed um, the way we communicate with each other um, because at the same time, because of the way it works, you have this, you also have a news feed, uh, which is something that we didn't have before, sort of like a Facebook style uh, news feed whereby you could just have some positive messages and, and photos and some just to, to drive positive engagement at the same time, uh, which which can happen in a much more organic way rather than top down from from uh, from support office people. So um, it's it's completely changed the way we we talk to each other uh, because we talk to each other a lot more now. It's not that we only communicate via a messaging service now, uh, but it means that we're much more efficient at uh, getting messages across and, and without having any middlemen. And um, yeah, it, it's, it's totally transformed us. So in the, in the questions, Mark Saunders has asked, how do we balance positive engaging staff messages when we're making staff redundancies? You know, balance of keeping current staff engaged, but being sensitive to the fact that actually, you know, some people have lost their jobs. Phil, what, what do you think about that? Uh, well, we haven't. We've only made three redundancies, and they were voluntary. In High five, you then. Um, we were adamant from uh, the minute that um, we went. It obviously all kicked off. We made a commitment to our staff on pretty much just the next day that uh, we we did we created something called fifty percent Corona pay, which was we we committed our staff in March all the way that they'd get at least five weeks of fifty percent pay, 
all the way up until the end of April, no matter what happened. Um, knowing for what, I mean, we'd heard the government say, hey, help is coming. They didn't spell it out. I think it was about, it was about a four or five day gap between help is coming mm-hmm. and the actual mm-hmm. announcement of what furlough was going to be. So, of course, five days later, all that Corona pay work and a bit like Marcus said, you know, you're, you're running your business three days at a time doing something and three days later it was out of date. But all that work was completely irrelevant because five days later, Rishi came in with 80 percent. We all obviously flipped onto that. But we've been adamant from day one that there wasn't going to be uh, we're going to do whatever we possibly could not to make anybody to cut anyone loose anyway um, overnight, certainly make any rash decisions. So um, and we've managed to stick with that um, so far. You know, there's been some natural attrition. Obviously, people gone back to their own countries or whatever, or, or moved out of the city or from where, where they were living and made the decision not to come back to work. And that's that's fine. Um, but yeah, so we haven't really, to, to answer Mark's question, we haven't really had to make that balance yet. Um, a, a, bit, a big thing for us is when people came back, when, when the time came to reopen the restaurants for delivery and then uh, eating after that, we sort of threw it around the table for a while that, you know, we want to open some restaurants. Let's just get out there and tell people that we need to open restaurants and um, stuff. But we made a decision that we'd make that voluntary, um, mm-hmm. which we felt was really, really important that, the, that, you know, obviously people feeling varying degrees of discomfort around being at home or being out in the open and, and uh, around Corona itself. And we felt like it was really important that the staff themselves individually made the decision if they want to come back. Um, and based, uh, we put a survey out again, we had a, we've, we've had a great internal comms talk and workplace by Facebook for a good couple of years now. And I just can't imagine how we would have done it without it because we can use these bots to individ- uh, message into people individually. I mean, literally we triangulated where everybody lived can nearest to their nearest restaurant, necessarily the one they used to work in. And we asked everyone confidentially, privately, if they wanted to come back to work and if they didn't, that was fine. Um, and based on the people who said yes, of which there were a lot, because a lot and a lot of people were citing mental health as a reason they wanted to come back to work rather yeah. than stay home. Um, based on the people we got who volunteered, those are the restaurants we opened, um, yeah. which I'm really proud of. And actually, I think the, the kudos we got for the 50% pay, um, which I'd say ultimately was was irrelevant, but uh, and the way we went about reopening restaurants, I think we we got a lot of. Um, internal goodwill from that and i think that's really carried us through the last seven months to be honest because people really felt like actually we're in it together and it's that whole you know we've already touched on the the themes of it but that whole kind of the power of volunteer rather than someone who's been told what to do you know uh and and i still think we're riding on the on the the kind of wave of that albeit i do think people are getting a bit battle weary now we, we call it the battle of corona been honest and we sort of inscripted uh conscripted everybody into where people enlisted themselves into the mm-hmm. honest army um, and I think people are starting to get a bit weary of that. So it's, uh, I think we need a change of identity as soon as possible. But well, I think, yeah, we've not had to, but, we've not really had to deal with that issue, to be honest. Well, I think despite not having having made uh, more than sort of two or three people having lost their jobs, um, you've answered that question quite neatly, I think, if I'm honest with you. Um, Jade, from your perspective, um, how do you kind of balance that message in between kind of the challenging stuff and the, the let's keep everyone feeling pumped up and excited stuff? I think it is really difficult and I think it does come back again. You know, personally, I have always responded very well to strong leadership and leadership that is honest and down to earth. But I also think in this situation, what was really important was the the community and the management management of this situation in a site. So your site may not be affected, but it was important that the managers understood what was going on so they could then speak to their teams about it in a way that's really like, look, you know, we, luckily we're OK here, but be, please be aware that some people, some sites, you know, are are having to make changes and it is difficult. Um, but I, I don't think a sort of blanket approach, big um announcement was the right way we didn't do that and i don't i think that was right i think it was better to treat people individually and and to say as i you know um, i did with my own team to say look you know i want you to be aware of what's happening but i also don't want you to be worried um and trying to balance it i mean it is it is difficult it is actually you know they don't go together you know redundancies and a positive outlook don't go together so it's about how you manage that and also how honest you are with the people that are unfortunately the ones that are affected, you know, and, and how you can just be as honest as possible with them. Um, and people have been fantastic. You know, people have been super understanding and it's such a difficult time. But I also think 
rightly or wrongly, the media has really stoked this fire. And, pe you know, some people, when you speak to them to say, look, unfortunately, we're having to look at the possibility of this happening. They're like, yeah, we, you know, we get it um, from, from looking around. We know yeah. what's happening in the world. So, yeah, which is it's, it's quite, um, you know, when you have to take those decisions, I mean, it's, it's almost a bit sad, isn't it? That it's you, know, very you have to have those conversations. Everybody who I've had to have those conversations with says, yeah, it's, it's, sort of, it's the way the world goes at the moment. It's quite sad, isn't it, that people are almost expecting it, mm. uh, which, is, uh, which is, you know, even more, uh, you know, that's why it's even more important to have these face-to-face -face conversations mm. um, with people. So we, uh, we actually, the only site we've closed was in the O2 arena. Um, inside the O2 arena, all the other sites remain open for delivery. And as I said, I know we we, um, we open delivery kitchens uh, in, throughout the pandemic. But uh, very much like Phil said, uh, people volunteered. We asked them whether they wanted to come to work, yep. and the vast, vast, vast majority did, citing mental health uh, because they wanted to uh, they wanted to um, to just be around other people. Uh, it, it just you know, and, and we then equally we uh, you know we, we made a real conscious effort to be in sites uh, every day, uh, speak to people um, and, and, and see them and see that they're doing okay. You know, the other day uh, when we were a little bit unsure about what's happening next right now, uh, you know, one of the guys here in the office uh, said one of our marketing team said, "Mark, if the, if the, if the, uh, the government guidance changes." Please don't make me go back home. <laughs> it's for my own sanity. I live on my own. I want to come to the office. I, I don't want to work from home. So I think it, it's the importance is to have really honest conversations with these individuals. Um, so. I, I'm a, a big fan of Kim Scott's book, Radical Candor. It takes the emotion out of kind of feedback, yeah. and it's all about just having honest conversations um, without that kind of emotional element as much as you possibly can do and it yeah. en enables us and empowers us to be able to deliver that news yeah um, and i think it's absolutely key it's kind of you you've uh, you've all kind of made a similar point you've got people who want to come back to work because their mental health is suffering by not being at work in hospitality we're social butterflies by nature you know we're used to being around people um so it does create a challenge um ola jiddy has asked a question um how do we keep people motivated and staying positive with all of the news around coronavirus because we're bombarded you know we are absolutely bombarded with news jade you touched on that that's right or wrong the, the, the media is absolutely brilliant with everything so how do we keep our people positive while that's happening i just tell people don't watch the news or listen to the news especially not the speculation especially even during lockdown i was like if you want to get like your absolute facts about what's happening like take it from the government website don't be reading the news because they're you're right like rightly or wrongly there was just you know there's so much stuff you read something and you're like you know well this one's saying this and this is saying that and nobody actually knows what's going to happen so i think the biggest thing on that is to only take the things that we know to be facts so i was having to do this a lot, like a, a lot of my friends who were chefs and were, at the beginning of the pandemic were you know concerned about losing their job restaurants were never going to open again you weren't going to be able to be a chef it wasn't going to be a career that existed anymore and i just kept saying like okay like let's just deal with the absolute facts that we have in front of us and take things day by day because we we don't know and like you know it's still an ever evolving situation so well, also, it's so important to switch off from a mental health point of view, taking time to completely switch off from the news. And I feel like social media is the devil when it comes to this, because you'll see, you know, in some ways it's so good. It's been so great in the way that it's kind of like got every rallied everybody together to support the industry and you know, counsel the curfew and all of these kind of things. But then it, there's also a lot of speculation that happens on there as well. So I think like one of the biggest things we can do to kind of look after our mental health in that respect is to just ignore the news. <laughs> don't read it, don't pay any attention to it. Only only pay attention to the things that we know are the facts rather than the speculation. Yeah, I mean, And it's true because there's a bit of a, a weird theme. I don't know if I'm just, you know, noticing something that's not there, but with a lot of the things like the furlough scheme and with, you know, further restrictions, there'll be things that are leaked that sound really, really worrying and really devastating mm -hmm. to the industry. And actually, what comes out is slightly better. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's just like this mass panic, mass, you know, you feel down, people are speculating in the workplace and, 
it's not a good vibe and then something comes out and you think oh okay so they're not actually closing restaurants they're gonna close pubs and bars and even though that's still awful actually mm-hmm. when you're thinking about your own business you, you know it it's yeah exactly what you're saying it's just not fact so yeah. <laughs> so uh, for me is, you know we, we talk a lot about the mental health of our team and it's great that we we obviously we we care for our teams and we want to make sure they're looked after but kind of i worry about you guys you know you kind of you're dealing with difficult situations and you're dealing with lots of lots of days where the news could change overnight so just yesterday you know when i called and spoke to you phil um i i thoroughly expected that you would be uh, possibly watching um boris johnson's uh, uh, talk in parliament and your first response was i don't watch anymore here and it's just it's not for me right now and i'm like that's joyous to be fair so what sort of steps are you guys taking to look after your own mental health because you're leading you're leading the line on this you know it's you've got to every now and again remember to put your own mask on first oh Phil. god um other than that beer fridge that's sitting behind you <laughs> hey that's that's a secret <laughs> I'm actually a gin and tonic guy. Um, I don't. I, I'm. I yeah. I don't. I don't know really. I'm not probably the best one to talk to about it. I, I just. Um, you just. I just do what you do, and um, it's been ten years of just doing what you do. And at the moment, doing that is a bit harder. But um, so personally, I'm not necessarily someone that needs to talk a lot to people and sort of share feelings and emotion and. I don't know, I might just be setting myself up to be like category A for someone who absolutely does need it. Um, <laughs> um, but I don't feel like I do. I've got, um, I can just feel like Toby Ann looking at me going, yeah, you, this, is like, this is like classic. Like, oh, you know, you know. Cool you I'm off. fine, I'm fine, I'm all right, don't worry about it. I think it. she's I'm just right. made a note in her calendar yeah. to come back yeah. to you in like yeah, six confirm. months time. Yeah. No, I've got two young kids, so they, you know, they're, they're you know, they're, you know, five and two or something, uh, two and a half, and um, not two and something, that's bad. Um, <laughs> this is nearly three, actually, name, I remember. Um, I don't know what that's, that way, why that's relevant, but yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't, I'm not a huge, I, I've always liked working hard, and um, yeah, I like a challenge, and this is one of the biggest challenges of all time, so um, from a personal point of view, I'm, I'm feeling okay, but I've definitely seen the impact on our, on our exec team, I would say, um, who've just been working just incredibly hard um and in and in two minds and i think some of the tension we felt over the last couple of months and i i am not uh, i'm guilty of doing this to them because um there's obviously a very serious bau kind of need right now and all our business as usual kind of day-to-day jobs have just been amplified by 10 and you know we weren't sluggish before and we're you know the guys you know running our sort of brand growth teams and our people teams they just have to be reacting and trying to take all this information and understand what it means and how that applies to our people and do it in the right way. So they've just been just smashing out the hours on that. But then we've had this kind of fidgetiness to, um, there's another word for you, um, to kind of take the opportunity we've been given, which is time, as you said at the start of the, of the call, to actually do some stuff and kind of come back, you know, into a sense of normality in a way that we want honest to be. So I, and I've been very big on that. So I then, you know, they're, they're all busy and then I walk into them like guys why are we not gonna we need to do this and we need to like not have area managers anymore and all this kind of stuff and I think yeah. that has been quite difficult for them knowing which head to be in at the, depending on what the meeting is and and I guess I, I would this is my public apology to them now really that I, I know I've been in some sessions where I've kind of waded in with some hey let's think about the future and they're like hey why don't we just think about keeping some of our restaurants open how about that and like, <laughs> So, you know, I think that's been really difficult. And I know they're also engaged in the future plans. Like this is, this is, this goes back to before Corona, you know, we've not, we've wanted to do these things for a while. We were on this journey, this anti-chain journey anyway, and I've wanted to accelerate it and, and be dynamic and try lots of different things. And, um, you know, I, I think that's been really difficult for them. So I, I've tried to reduce that a little bit for them. And, and, I, and I think, yeah, for them to just understand what, what meeting that, that meeting's about or what kind of part of the week they're in to focus on BAU versus bigger picture stuff has been really um, really important to distinguish between and not something we've got 100% right, I don't think, honest, over the last few months, me personally. Well, but recognising that is half the battle. Mark, mm-hmm. yeah. I think, I think, uh, no, look, I think it feels right. You know, you've got to keep people grounded because otherwise you're going to get into this circle of doom really easily. Um, but I think uh, everyone probably in the last few months has, has had their own dark moments where, uh, you know, if you're honest with yourself, I've never even... Personally, never really considered myself to, to have any 
issues with mental health that never, never, ever, ever considered that. Uh, totally oblivious from my personal point of view. Uh, but all of a sudden you find yourself having thoughts that you never had before. And, uh, and, and then it is uh, just super important to remind yourself of what you, what, what's really important. Um, uh, yeah, and then all of a sudden you see the smile of the kids and stuff. In a, in a very different way, uh, which is... Uh, That's what I was trying to say. Yeah. Tiny <laughs> <Sorry>, kids. <laughs> so what Phil meant was... Uh, <laughs> no, but, it, it's a, but, but I think overall, we have to, uh, from my point of view, I think we have to be really, really conscious um, about the impact that we all have as, uh, as leaders on the teams. Um, because, it's, you know, everybody senses panic and negativity. You know, you can, you can sense it. Immediately, and that doesn't matter whether it's us or whether it's the general manager in a business or whether anybody who manages a team leads a team, uh, you know, shouldn't underestimate uh, uh, the power of, of, of their actions and, and their behaviors. So I think it's super important to consciously remain positive without, I, I'm not saying, you know, don't be naive and portray the world through rose tinted glasses, you know, be honest and frank. But, uh, but I think there's a huge responsibility on, on anyone who's a leader to, uh, uh, to make sure that they keep the troops uh, engaged. So, you know, the, the business as usual thing that Phil just said, I love because, you know, it's one of the best ways to do it, right? Concentrate on the here and now, making customers happy, uh, work together as a team, focus on, on an excellent product and great customer service. And, uh, uh, you know, that, that's what matters. You know, if you, if you do that every time, then uh, chances are, you know, might even save our business. Well, that's focusing on the things that we can control, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, we yeah. can deliver amazing experiences, yeah. we can deliver amazing food, and we yeah. can take the opportunity to make people smile. And do it together, look, out, look after each other, you know, so. Absolutely. Jade, you've been an integral part of kind of uh, a foe over this time, as we were talking yesterday. How, how have you been looking after yourself? I mean, yeah, I'll be a lot, you know, different for me. I don't have kids. Um, and actually, in the beginning, me and my husband were thinking, oh my God, thank God we don't have kids. But now, you know, I think there would be a lot of joy and there would be, you know, your priorities change and actually that's a positive for a lot of people. But for, for me personally, I have suffered with mental health issues. You know, I've had anxiety in my entire life, pretty much in some, you know, things that I used to do when I was a child and I would think, why did I do that? And I grew up and I was like, oh, right, that's why. Um, but the way that I managed it was was really obvious things, you know, being outside, speaking to people on the phone or whatever it was, just making sure that I had time away because there was a period of time where out of the, you know, we had around 800 employees at the beginning of lockdown and there were three of us that were not furloughed. So it was a lot of pressure and it was, a, it was just nonstop. Um, but actually just to say, if I've got 10 minutes in between calls or meetings, I'm going to go and sit in the garden and be outside and, you know, exercising, prioritizing things that I, I actually had to schedule in, which I would never have done before. Yep. Um, really helped. And to be honest, you know, at the end in September, I took a week off and it was just amazing. I just needed it. And actually, when you speak about Marco saying that, you know, you really can tell how you're feeling and it can really sort of filter down to other people i was feeling like this is what i am and the way i was reacting to certain situations was not the way i would normally act because it was just so much pressure and it had been for such a long time um you know things all over the place for so long so it was really important to take that time and actually for hr people generally during this time i think yeah you know basically well done guys <laughs> because it's just been so difficult and taking those little moments just to go and look outside get some fresh air do what you can just do it because it will make your work so much better it will make you know the people that you are around so much happier as well yeah for sure tobiana from your perspective kind of uh, what um what do you think we can be doing to just take some steps the guys have talked through some of the things that are important to them a child think- smile a day I walk out in the garden. <laughs> the thing that I always say is just to go back to the absolute basics. Like um, whenever, like talking about with COVID and the pandemic and also talking about people who work in hospitality before that and now is like, you are your basic needs getting met? Are you sleeping well? Are you sleeping enough? Are you getting good quality of sleep? Are you eating 
not just are you eating healthfully, but are you actually taking the time to sit down and eat and consume at least two meals a day, preferably three. Exercising is another big one. Getting outside, talking with people, and especially when you work in hospitality, I think talking to people outside of hospitality is really beneficial because while it's great to talk to people who get it and understand it and are going through the same thing, sometimes we do get in our own little kind of hospitality bubble and sometimes the perspective of talking to somebody who, who isn't within that can be really helpful. So I just always suggest those basic things basically. And then other things that help for some people is like journaling and doing mindfulness and meditation. For some people, those things don't work. So it's about finding what works for you. But but you, what Jade was saying is so right, like actually dedicating the time to do that. So like exercise is another big one that's so, so important. So making sure that you're actually scheduling in the time to be like, no, this is the time I'm going to take out of my day to prioritize myself and look after my own mental health and well-being because we actually all have mental health. So it's something that we all need to work on regardless of whether we think we have um, you know, good mental health all the time. To maintain that, we need to be like actively working on it. Yeah, I love that. Absolutely. Okay, so Marcus Whedon has asked a good question. Marcus is doing a huge amount of the good work at the moment around helping people who are looking to get into work and uh, who are facing the challenges on there. And he's asked the question, um, has anything changed with regards to the people you're looking at bringing into your business or how they're brought into your business? Um, Jade, from your perspective. I mean, that's interesting. Yeah, I think, I think actually the sense of how the sense of community that this this situation has for you know has bred which is great um does make you think about the people that you have in your business and you know this is a difficult time so you need people to be on their game and you and because you are working so hard you want people to mirror that you know themselves so i do think we've all thought a lot about yeah the kind of people that actually that luckily we have um but the qualities that they have that have made them so wonderful during this period. And that doesn't necessarily always have to be a skill. It might just be somebody that's relentlessly positive or relentlessly, you know, chipper all the time, which is great. Um, or it might be somebody that's super organized and is actually asking lots of questions and has lots of feedback. So I think it definitely has made me think about, you know, what are we going to be doing in the future when it comes to the time that we're going to be recruiting again? Um, because who knows, you know, maybe another crisis will happen and, and really you need your A-team everywhere. Absolutely. Marco, what, what are your yeah, thoughts? Yeah, it's, 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 I think the short answer is I, I don't think we're looking for or I would be looking for anything different because corona or not, I'd be looking for happy people. Uh, corona or not, I'd be looking for people who are great team players. Corona or not, I look for people who are potential talent and top performers. So it, it, what it has done is it's probably amplified those behaviours and, and, and just highlighted the importance of that. So I think um, I, th I think that's the only difference. But uh, wouldn't you always have those types of people, regardless of a pandemic? I don't know. Fingers <laughs> no, I, I, in an ideal world, yes, right? So In an ideal world, yes. But also... <laughs> You know, maybe I'm a bit more just because I've been recruiting people for so long for in so many different roles, as I'm sure we all have, that yeah. sometimes you just don't know, you know, like somebody you just don't know. And I think something that I have thought about is how can we know, how can we be a little bit more sure now about mm. somebody's qualities? What can I bring to the recruitment process that we didn't have before that actually will set those triggers off and will show a person for really what they might be in six months time mm -hmm. do you know what and, and that's I, I, I totally i totally agree with you on that i think i don't think anything has changed in terms of behaviors that you've been looking for I mean, as i said you know even even when times are great and rosy you want the best performers and the happiest people who who get on well with your team right i think i think you want them anyway but you're right the, the process and we've recently hired a few managers I don't think I've ever been so rigorous in the process. Assessing people through different um, um, uh, different different stages. So uh, yeah, I think the, the testing and assessing has been much much more in depth. Um, Excellent. Excellent. So Phil, you, so, Phil, you talked about making talks some about changes. That's, yeah. That noise is gone now, isn't it? Good. That's nice. Oh yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, I never, you never need to hear my voice echoed three times. It's not good. Um, you, you talked about making some changes to area manager roles and uh, the sort of structure of your business. Um, yeah. Do you think that will impact kind of who you're looking to bring in in the future? Uh, certainly in, in a kind of central support kind of function. Yeah. Um, you know, um, anybody who wants to join that team now really needs to be of the mindset that they're, they're here to kind of facilitate and support rather than um, manage, so to speak. Um, so that, that definitely will have an impact on the, the type of person that we try and um, attract. Or I, I would say it's more important about the, the type of person that we attract. I think the onus is on us. You know, we can all go out looking for happy people, but um, I think it's, you know, it's down to us to make them happy, right? I don't believe there's anyone out there that couldn't work at honest values and be successful if we create the right environment for them. And and I think if we're clear and upfront about who we are, you know, and the kind of world that we want to move into, the kind of structure we want to move into isn't necessarily going to be right for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, some people do like a manager and some people do like to have very clear structure of, sort of KPIs and a really good hierarchical flow above them. And, and if we're going to break that down, then we have to be very clear about that from the outset and make, manage expectations. So I, I imagine the pool of people that will be interested in us will change. I like to think it will get bigger rather than smaller. Um, I think certainly more, more at the grassroots level, we've, we've through Corona, we've realized actually, and, and, and this quite, will be quite specific to our business in that actually, you know, the, the distinction between back of house and front of house and we, we, we we don't, I don't want to call it cross training because my people director will kill me for using that word. It's not that it's, <laughs> it's, um, it's varied skills, I think is the term. And, and actually saying, you know, so we, we've been, we initiated a program called back to Brixton, uh, Brixton being our original restaurant where, you know, me and Tom were literally, it didn't matter one day I'd be in the kitchen, one day I'm on the floor. And actually the culture around that is everybody can learn the same skills. And of course, right now we need a disproportionate amount of chefs that we do front of house, uh, certainly during lockdown we did with delivery being the main driver of revenue. And potentially that's where it's going again for the next couple of months. So we've been frantically trying to um, upskill, not cross-train people uh, into more back of house skills. So we've been we've been running thirty or forty people through a program every week uh, for for about the last I think it stopped now a couple of weeks ago, but for the last sort of ten weeks previous to that, we've been just and that that then has enabled us to get those guys out of furlough and back into in, into positions um, within the business, working in the kitchens and front of house. So we've been trying to create a bit more of an environment where you're not just a griller or a waiter, you're actually someone that could do anything. Um, and I think uh, to build on that, we, we released something called Craft Exchange, which is, again, I won't take the credit for it. Um, the, 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 the people guys in our business um, came up with this, but it's one of the things, one of the best things I think we've ever done. Um, and it, basically what it says is we've got a bunch of people in, in our business that want hours, have skills beyond hospitality, right? And that's the best thing about industry. You know, 80% of the people in our in our business uh, want to be in, um, you know, they're going to be at uni, going to be doctors, nurses, engineers, whatever, right? And yep. yet, when the call comes in for we need our plants checked or we need windows cleaned or we need, uh, you know, sign writing done, we go out and we spend money on external companies when actually that skill set sits within our own business. So we created this thing called Craft Exchange, which basically allows our own people within the business to sort of register their skills beyond waiting or cooking burgers and we now have a real discipline and actually i had it yesterday i was thinking yesterday i want to do some crazy video just for a bit of fun really i think going back to some of the questions earlier about how do you motivate staff i think sometimes we just need to have a bit of fun so i just decided i'll put a little team together we're just going to do like a flash mob video or something i don't know whatever we can do to have a bit of fun and i thought oh we use these great guys that we used to do some videos a couple of months ago and i thought no i can't do that because we've got uh, benji in king's cross who does our videos now because he's brilliant and he works for us as a waiter and actually he's the guy that's gonna have to do that and that's so really great discipline. So now we've got, you know, our own people doing our sign writing and, you know, going around and keeping our plants in, in the planters and all that kind of stuff. And I think my, my the imprint for me, my point of view on that was I challenged our guy, our people director in particular to say, you know, we've got to drop our egos a little bit in this industry, I think. And actually this is a conversation that was happening pre corona This is more of a Brexit. And let's all just remember Brexit for a second, shall we? Glad <laughs> the B word. So um, we've gone 55 minutes without mentioning it, Phil. Sorry, <laughs> mate. sorry. Um, that you know, it, it it really started then. And actually, we've got to drop our egos and try and stop trying to get everyone on these truncated career paths that they maybe don't want, and try and insist on the kind of fast promotions. And you got to, if you want to grow, you've got to become a manager and then a GM and then a this and an area manager. And actually, we're a stepping stone. We're a stepping stone for a lot of people. And if we just accepted it, and then said, well, let's just try and be the best stepping stone out there. 
um, I think we'd have a much better situation. And I, I'm really happy to sort of have someone come and work even just three months for us and say, hey, I'm just here for three months until I go and be an actor or a doctor at a uni. And I think if we create an environment where that person can either further those skills beyond hospitality within our business, then I think we're just going to be in a better place culturally and, and performance wise. So that kind of ties into everything we're kind of working on, really, actually just going, do you know what, let's, let's drop our egos as a business and, and accept the fact that some people just want to travel through our business. Yeah. And let's just help them. <laughs> let's just yeah. help them. Because we'll the we'll get... that will come Sorry. out of it is that people will go and whether it's three months, three years or whatever it is, they will always look back and say, I had a really good time. Mm-hmm. I really totally. Do. We call it a glorious exit, which is um, not, that's, it sounds disgusting when I say it out loud. Um, <laughs> we call it a happy ending. Somewhere <laughs> I work, so. I mean, the, that's the first time I've said it in a, in this kind of environment. I've only said it, in, and I said, but what I mean by that is, like you should, whether you leave in 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 what you would call bad circumstances, it should still feel like the right decision. Like you still feel mm-hmm. like the feedback has been given. And actually you've been very honest and, and it shouldn't be a surprise. And if you leave because your performance isn't good enough or or we've messed up, then you should be able to have that conversation with someone. It should still be a glorious exit. And likewise, if you know, everyone should be able to look back and go, I got what I needed from honest. Mm-hmm. I love that. Glorious exit. There's a film yeah. waiting to be made, undoubtedly, on that one. But uh... I can already feel my phone will be going off with anyone who from honest who's listened to that and it's just gonna I'm gonna be getting messages. Yeah, I can absolutely <laughs> imagine. I can absolutely imagine. Guys, that was a really great conversation and there's loads more that we could discuss, but I think we we answered some good questions and you shared a whole load of insight into your businesses and what's important to you and why people at the heart of what you do as operators. Um, Very, very cool to be around. Thank you very much for your time. I'm going to welcome Louise back into the conversation. Hello. Hello. (laughs) So I've got, I've got how long? A few minutes, just to, just to sum up before our glorious exit, which oh, I. No. <laughs> which I... <laughs> so there was just, just, just quickly to sum up. There's so much, there's so much to say. It was really interesting to hear Phil about, uh, and and Marco actually about how you're stripping out that level of kind of hierarchy and making mentors, and and I think that's a that's a real thing, and I, I think it, 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 you know, it could be the the future of of leadership per se. Um, but a few things uh, that came out uh, for me that there was some some real kind of powerful words, and 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 it all comes you know it all comes round to the people. Um, the words were open-minded, creative, openness, communication, and honesty. And actually, you know, w- within if if there's anything positive that this pandemic has, has given us, is is they are all you know real positive traits of leadership. And as as Marco said, you know these these are the traits that are nothing really different from what we were looking for before. But I think it's just really really been accent- accentuated. Um, and the impact of of leaders is as as Jade alluded to, you know. The, the impact of how we are as leaders on our teams we should not in, uh, underestimate the power that we have um and um uh and the importance of looking after ourselves as 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 tobiana said uh that to, you know to look after that that then impact on on the rest of our team so i just want to say thank you it's 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 been um i didn't expect it to to I thought we were going to talk more about kind of business and structure and 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 impacts on revenue, but but it all comes around to the people and the leadership at the end of the day. I think when we're all under extreme pressure and difficulty, and my hat goes off to all of you. You've been admirable, and it's it's been a really really great discussion. So thank you so much on behalf of uh, Harry and uh, and Code Hospitality, and and thank you for your fantastic uh hosting skills kieran as always um sorry and, i didn't uh, put some revenue enough uh, my apologies it's been fantastic and and on that note we will all gloriously exit <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank Phil. you that's never leaving you now brother thank you so much. <laughs> bye-bye see ya see you later